Hi friends, this is Joe. This is the Decahedron RPG podcast, and this is the third week of OSR October for 2024. And this week, we are talking about the way experience points worked in the earliest games, you know, in that proto Dungeons and Dragons era when uh, Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax were still working through the rules. And we are getting our information from First Fantasy Campaign, which was published by Judges Guild back around 1980 or so. Around there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we're talking about experience. So, let's do it. So, one of the differences between old school play and new school play is XP for gold. In the very beginning of the game, you got XP for gold. And it was that way in all the Dungeons & Dragons sets, the basic Dungeons & Dragons, if you will. Um, it was that way in AD&D, 1st and 2nd edition. And in 3rd edition, they took that out, and you only got XP for killing things. I don't know what it is in 5th edition. If you know, throw a note below, because I'm curious. But I, I still don't think you get XP for gold. And I, I see both sides of the argument, right? Just because this thing had more treasure, I get more experience. That doesn't make me a better fighter. But I could argue that just because you killed 10 million orcs doesn't mean that you're a better spellcaster either if you're, you know, a spellcasting class. The treasure for gold always made sense to me because like so many in the OSR community say, it encourages smarter play. I, If I can go steal that treasure, if I can get the dragon's treasure without fighting the dragon, even better, right? Because especially in old school play, combat is deadly. And if you fight the dragon, there's a good chance that you're not going to walk away. So, yeah, I'm I'm all in favor of XP for gold. Yeah. But when Dave Arneson was making the game, he felt that that wasn't quite enough. To get the gold wasn't enough. That maybe <laughs> you had to spend it on stuff. There, there's an exception. There's a caveat. And uh, so that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the, the stuff that Dave wrote down for, for First Fantasy Campaign. So, let's take a look at the first thing. Dave says, Many characters wonder what they should spend their money on and what it will get for them in exchange. Just accumulating the money is not really enough of a guide in some case as to what the players do between expeditions, besides healing themselves up. So the following is presented as a supplement or alternative to the players. Instead of awarding points for the money and jewels acquired in the depths of the dungeon or hoarding items against the indefinite future, players will receive no points until they acquire the items listed below unless it happens to already fall within the area of interest. So what Dave is saying there is that, I don't know, I guess <laughs> the game was boring. <laughs> Uh, if they just had money and they just collected money and they just kept getting money and money and money and money and money. And so um, they need to spend it. And I think this in AD&D is kind of replaced by the spend money for training uh, to gain your levels, which I know Jason over at Nerds RPG Variety Cast is a big fan of. Um, I think this might have been the source of that rule or a different approach to the problem, which is that in order for the characters to advance in levels, they have to keep finding all this treasure. And probably in order to motivate them to go down to the dungeons, they have to find all this treasure. But they just keep getting this treasure and treasure. And so, so what do you do with it? Gary's solution was pay for training. Dave's solution is to spend it on these items. That last sentence that he says is a little convoluted, which is pretty much uh, you don't get money. Uh, I mean, sorry, you don't get experience for the stuff you find unless it already finds in your falls in your area of interest. And we're going to talk about that in a second. There's seven areas of interest that he lists. So it's I guess he is saying that if you find, um, let's say, casks of brandy, because you'll see uh, wine 
is the first uh, category of items. Um, if you find the cask of brandy, you get the XP for that because you you have it. It's already in your area of uh, interest. Um, so, like I said, there's seven areas of interest. Let's look at them one by one. The first one, like I said, is wine. But by that, he means alcohol in general. Let's take a look. Dave says, wine. Spirits with the relatively high alcoholic content that is immediately consumed by the player to the limits of his capacity. This must be repeated after recovery by the player until all of the alcoholic beverages purchased have been consumed by the player before he can proceed on another expedition. An exception to this is that if he comes into conflict with other players and loses the purchased wine, whereupon he can proceed on an expedition, he receives no points for the item so lost. Experience gained while drunk does not count, but the treasure does. All right. So that's the first category, wine. And you can see that it's not enough to buy the wine because then you're just hoarding wine, right? You have to drink it. And apparently you have to drink it to excess. And yeah. And then there's all this complication about, and if you're drunk and like something happens, I think he's like referring to a bar fight or something. Um, you don't get experience for that. But I, yeah, I don't know. It seems... In my mind, well, one, it seems juvenile. Uh, two, it seems overly complicated. But wait, there's more. The second category is women. So let's take a look at what Dave said. Women. The player will immediately proceed to the local establishment and expend all funds desired on room plus extras that, at that place. So the word written here, I'm not going to say because the YouTube algorithm might ban me forever. Um, let's say forced workers. <laughs> uh, forced workers of the appropriate type left to the players may also be purchased with the funds and with the funds and utilized to fulfill this classification. These workers may then be sold at reduced value. The difference being credited to the player's account. Money stolen does not count in this area. Okay, so <laughs> if I thought the last one was juvenile, this one, this one is even worse, right? This, I, I, um, I did an episode called Sex in D&D a &D long, long time ago. First year we were doing episodes and um, I'm not a big fan of including sexual stuff in my role playing. I guess most of this would be off screen. Um, and I'll give this credit, right? D&D at this point isn't trying to emulate high fantasy, right? We're not doing a grand Tolkien adventure. We are more emulating swords and sorcery. And how many times does Conan start a story dead broke? even though in the last one he was loaded and rich. And so therefore he's blowing all his money on something. And okay, so we are matching the, the fiction, which I don't have a problem with. Um, it's just, it's, it's awfully codified. And um, the whole forced labor thing, I, I, especially this kind of forced labor, it's, it's cringe in a big way. And, and I... I don't like it at all. Um, in fact, I think I'm going to do a whole episode on that after OSR October because that same topic pops up in another game. And uh, yeah. Anyway, um, so wine, women. Can you guess what the, the third one is? It's, it's pretty obvious. It's song. Let's look at what Dave says. Song. The player proceeds to the local tavern and expends his wealth on other players present in either category A or B or C. By the way, A or B or C, that's the wine, the women, and the song. Damages assessed by the tavern owner are counted towards the player's expenditures in this area. Experience gained as a result of area C will count towards this area only if the player is not inebriated when this was done. Inability to pay all debts so incurred in this or the above areas may result in imprisonment if they can get you or banishment if you get away. 
All right, so what Dave is calling song here is really just partying, carousing, right? It's going down to the tavern and buying drinks for everybody because it says the other players have to be present, right? Um, so it's, it's throwing a party, and he assumes that violence will ensue and that there will be damages and bar fights and stuff, and uh, you will have to pay for the, those damages. And again, getting muddy specific as to what happens if you can't. Um, and again, just so juvenile and so th this is not my style. This, I, I am not a fan of this kind of play, but you know, maybe I'm an old footy duddy. Uh, so that was why women in song. Let's look at the next category. The next category is wealth, which is merely the stockpiling of gold, silver, and similar items of value by the player. If these items are stolen, the player loses the full value immediately upon discovery and may lose levels as a result. <laughs> now that strikes me as, as kind of weird and funky. Um, you got the money. And I get the logic though, right? Because if getting the money gave you this experience, then losing the money should make you lose that experience, right? But then to lose levels on top of it, that's, that's just weird. Um, I think what I would do if I decided to implement this, which I'm not even convinced I would, is uh, I wouldn't make you lose the levels, but I'd make you lose the experience points. So say you were fifth level and you lost all your money and I don't know, let's say that puts you at a thousand experience points less, uh, you know, it puts you in that fourth level category. I would still keep you at fifth level, but you'd have to still get your experience points up to where you need they need them to be for six level to get that six level, um, you know. So to have to make up that thousand deficit plus you know the difference between fifth and sixth. If I were to implement, I don't know if I would implement this. I I don't know. Um, <laughs> and also the interesting thing is uh, you only lose the experience upon discovery. So if you stockpile the money and you never check on it, <laughs> you're okay if it gets stolen. <laughs> um, again, though, I see where he's going for because greed, right? Avarice, it's a, it's a classic vice. And he's just saying, this is your character's vice. And so he wants to accu accumulate all this money, right? He's Scrooge McDuck, I guess. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there it is. Let's look at the next one. The next one is fame. This is gained by straight combat with creatures and players in the game. The qualifying factor is that there must be another player who will attest to your prowess in public. Otherwise, no points are gained. Judges may award partial point totals if the bodies are discovered later by other players who must also attest to your results up to 75% normal value. Flunkies, non-player characters, can also attest to your success, you get half value then, but can also, depending on loyalty, attest to deeds that you did not do. The judge will not give you the points, but will publicly agree with your new level. Points are gained only when participating in C above, that's song, which was the partying. Although the player need spend none of his funds on the party itself, wait for someone else. At the end of the party, the points will be awarded. So we're actually kind of following the, the seven classic vices again, aren't we? Because uh, this is pride is really what this is, right? Fame, pride, fame, uh, vainglory, all that fun stuff. Um, yeah, I killed that thing. What I don't understand about this one, though, is that this whole thing is about how you have to spend your gold in order to get the XP for that gold. And how do you spend XP by bragging, especially when it says that you don't have to pay for the party yourself? Um, unless this is supposed to be saying that even your normal combat you don't get the XP for unless somebody else is there to witness it and talk about it uh, later. That's not what this whole category is talking about, but you know, early D&D is not laid out logically at all anyway. So maybe that's what this is about. I do like the part there about getting NPCs to lie about it. Interestingly, you can't get PCs to lie about it. 
Um, and the fact that he says that you won't get the XP, but the judge will publicly agree to your new level makes me think that this was used a lot. Well, that Dave's table is very um, player versus player at times. <laughs> and so it was useful for other players to think you are a higher level than you were. The next category is uh, religion and spirituality. Let's see what Dave has to say about it. Religion or spiritualism. Awarded when a player gains experience points while engaged in a quest or otherwise cooperating with a cleric, maybe himself, on a task. Funds are given to the local religious denomination, up to the player, whereupon he will gain the points. Real player clerics may refuse to accept the offering, and the player will get no points. Refusal to accept may get the player in trouble, depending on what the cleric said. Money given to the denomination may be spent by the clerical type once 40 to 90%, roll a six-sided die, is sent to H. See how to become a bad guy for details. All right, so I, I get what they're saying here. Donate the money to the church. And you can even donate it to one of the other uh, clerics in the party. They have to send most of it away, but they can keep some of it. Interesting. Um, that last part has to send it to H dot dot dot. There's an ellipsis in the, uh, in the book. I don't know if this is like... They couldn't find, like, so what happened when Judges Gill printed this book is that Dave Arneson just sent them a bunch of disorganized notes and they had to try to put them together. And if you've heard about his time at TSR, like when he handed over Blackmore, it was just a pile of disorganized notes that they then had to put together at TSR. And... When you read about the in the court case where it talks about like how much each of them did and for Dungeons and Dragons, there's this thing about Arneson sending Gygax like 18 pages of notes. Uh, and in fact, uh, John Peterson talks about when uh, Arneson was looking for work after TSR, someone wrote him a letter of recommendation. And one of the notes in there is that, you know, he was in the need of a good editor to to finish things. Um, yeah, not his strong point, which is funny, by the way, side note, tangent, you know, Arneson was a college graduate and Gygax was a high school dropout and Arneson can't write to save his life <laughs> and he's disorganized and he never finishes anything, right? That's, that's the reputation he has at least. Whereas, uh, Gygax rolled up his sleeves and he got things done. Interesting. Anyway. Uh, oh, so yeah, the H. Do, do, do. So I don't know if that's just the note was unfinished and it was going to say like send it to his bishop, his church, his something. Or if it's another category that's supposed to be listed because these are all lettered A, B, C, D up to G and there's no H. Um, I don't know. If I were to implement this, I would say his bishop type thing. His high priest. Maybe. High Priest. H. Maybe. Uh, it's also interesting to note that it says, see how to become a bad guy for details. And if you look at how to become a bad guy, doesn't talk about this at all. <laughs> it talks about, uh, like, if you're playing a monster, how much XP you need to go up from level to level. That's it. So I, I, I don't know. Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's, uh, let's look at the next one. Hobby. This is a catch-all category left to the judge to award details onto the players. Examples of some of the more obvious pursuits would be spell research by magic users specializing in, say, animal control or the raising and breathing of lycanthropes. Even the taking of spare parts and building of a new creature. Very difficult, but interesting. One's hobby could even be the devising of better torture machines, making gold, the building of flying machines, all up to the judge to outline and define within the limits of his campaign. So that's the last category. It's the, it's the catch-all. Uh, yeah, I, I like this one, actually. You know, the player tells you, you know, at character creation what their character's pursuit is, and then they get XP when they spend money on that pursuit. 
And I wouldn't even rule that the pursuit doesn't even have to be possible. They just have to think it's possible and have to be trained for it. Um, yeah, I, I, I like that one. The next section in the, in the thing, by the way, that was the last of the seven categories, areas of interest, uh, where you can spend money for XP. The next section talks about the honesty of a proprietor, which almost seems out of place, but let's, let's read it and then we'll talk about it. Part two, honesty of the proprietor versus the actual value of goods and services received from the expenditure of funds in the area of prime interest. The quickest way of handling this is to roll three dice for the honesty of the proprietor and divide it by 10. This can be used for the value of the goods brought up from the dungeon, not so much money as with jewels and items with values that cannot be easily determined. The judge can also use this procedure to sell items to the adventurers on their way down to the depths. Now, I think why this is in this section is because if you're getting money for the goods and you're getting XP for the money, then you only get XP for the amount of money you get when you sell it, not what it was actually worth. Which is interesting because James and I had a discussion about this on one of the early episodes too, and that was my position. He was, no, you should get the value of what it's worth, not what you can get for it. <laughs> I'm like, it's only worth what you got for it. Um, and I think what he's saying here is you roll the 3D6, so you get, you know, uh, 3 to 18 divided by 10. I think so. If you got 10 divided by 10, let's say you're getting 11. 11 divided by 10 is 1.1. So I think that's just a multiplier for all the values that he'll give you. So you brought up a thousand gold piece gem, he's going to give you 1100 gold pieces. That's pretty cool. My only problem with this is that it's weighted too heavily in favor of the player. <laughs> it's not realistic enough. Oh my goodness, I normally don't like that. <laughs> but, you know, if half the time uh, the merchant gives you more than it's worth, that merchant isn't going to be in business very long. So I would probably say roll the 3d6 minus 3. So give you a value from 0, they outright refuse to buy it, to 15. And that moves the center point down to between seven and eight, they're gonna pay you 70 to 80% of the value. That makes sense to me because then they sell it for 100% of the value. Economically, that works better. That's how I would do that. In fact, I like that rule a lot and I think I might keep that one. The next section is long and complex and there's two charts and he only ever talks about the second chart, but he references the first chart while kind of talking about the second chart. It's really, I figured it out, <laughs> but what it's all about is figuring out what your area of interest is. And rather than just saying, yeah, mine is A, the wine, or mine is, you know, the spirituality. Um, it's, so one method is going by your class. And then it says, you know, for a fighter, you get 100% on uh, wine, and you get 50% on women or stuff like that. You know, Cleric, I think, only gets 5% on women. So uh, if you have 100 gold and you spend it on women, uh, you only get five experience points for that. Whereas if you spend it on spirituality, you get your full 100. Uh, but then there's even a complex way of combining them and coming up with percentages and another one of rolling dice and making it varied even more. I would say just let the player pick if I were going to do it. Uh, but I'm not sure I would do it. I am not sure at all. If I were going to do this, if I was going to implement this at all, I would do away with those categories completely. And I would just say, you don't get your experience points until you spend the money. And I don't care what you spend it on. Um, other than, I would say, it can't be spent on healing. And it can't be spent on your adventuring gear. But beyond that, like if you want to build yourself a castle, if you want to buy a tavern, whatever. That's all great. Great stuff. Yeah. Uh, I would do it that way if I were to do it. I'm not convinced I would do it. Uh, some improvements in the game have actually been improvements. And I think the area of XP is one of them. Uh, although I would keep 
given XP for gold, uh, like I said at the front of the episode. This one feels like it went on longer than they have been lately. I apologize for that. I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you for listening and or watching. And until next time, happy gaming, happy life. Bye. Thanks for listening to